One of the things I personally love about fighting games is that I can play the World Warrior and DNF Duel and every fighting game in between this 30 year gap with this same lever and 6 button arcade stick layout. While the genre has gone in many different directions and has gotten more complicated within the games themselves, for the most part, the way you can physically play fighting games has mostly stayed static and intuitive. But what if we make a very simple change to try and spice things up and just... switch these around? Well, that's exactly what SNK did with the release of Brodiki 1 in 1999, forcing many poor arcade operators in Japan to go to their candy cabs and switch out their control panel. Because the big gimmick of Bariki 1 is the fact that you move with two directional push buttons and attack by moving the lever in different directions. But before we go in too deep with mechanics and how the game plays, let's get some backstory for Bariki 1 and SNK during the late 90s. In not even a decade's time, fighting games had reached a level of extreme mechanical realization and maturity that is pretty wild to think about in hindsight. And I think that's due to the sheer number of fighting games that were being pumped out in the 90s with SNK playing a big part of that. But while SNK was extremely busy putting out game after game on their 2D sprite based Neo Geo arcade hardware, they were still keeping up with the times by developing 3D fighters that attempted to innovate on the fighting game genre. Enter the Hyper Neo Geo 64, which was SNK's hopeful successor to the Neo Geo that was capable of outputting state of the art 3D graphics. Hitting the arcades in 1997, a year after the Nintendo 64 in North America, this piece of arcade hardware was technically impressive, but huge, expensive, and only had 7 games released for it in its 1.5 year supported lifespan, but for some reason had like 4 different board revisions. So, as you could probably guess, the Hyper Neo Geo 64 wasn't a runaway hit, and its 7 year old hardware predecessor outlived it by a long shot, but that doesn't mean the games released for it are bad or worth forgetting, because in all honesty, the small batch of 3D games are pretty good. And as a side note, fighting games probably had one of the best transitions to 3D in general. Don't be gaslighted by YouTubers who don't play fighting games calling Street Fighter EX and others bad games. Anyways, while I'd love to focus on the other Hyper Neo Geo 64 fighting games, this is a Budiki 1 video, and a big pain point of the hardware is that its ability to be emulated isn't all the way there yet. Which is another reason why the hardware and its games have fallen into obscurity regardless of the SNK and Neo Geo name. But Bidiki 1 in particular has always called out to me because of its unique control scheme. So I actually went out and bought a Hyper Neo Geo 64 board and a Bidiki 1 PC to give y'all the best look at this oddity I possibly can. My setup for this video is the Hyper Neo Geo 64 board being ran by my Haas Supergun, which is basically a device that consolizes arcade boards, with its image and sound being split by Voltar's double penetration into my JVC PVM and my Datapath E1S capture card. I had a lot of trouble trying to capture a great image for this video, so I hope you guys don't mind some noticeable deinterlacing. And of course, to top it all off, and to be as accurate as possible to the experience, I also made some of my very own Bariki 1 arcade sticks with the correct layout, because I didn't do all of this just to play the game wrong. Also, because I brought this setup to Texas Showdown, and I wanted others to experience this greatness. But, let's finally get down to business. In 1999, SNK released Bariki 1, which was the last game to grace the Hyper Neo Geo 64. Bariki 1 has its fighters entering the World Grapple Tournament 99 that's being held in Japan's Tokyo Dome Stadium. The World Grapple Tournament is a mixed martial arts event where one fighter will have to tear through a bracket consisting of 8 consecutive matches and be the last one standing to be declared champion. And more so than any other fighting game I can think of, Bariki 1's World Grapple Tournament actually feels like a real tournament. All of the matches take place in the arena, the characters have entrances and interviews, music is used very sparsely as the ambience of the crowd and impact of the blows fill the air during fights, and there are sponsors berating you with advertisements around every corner. I'm not immune to marketing. The aesthetics aren't the only thing wrapped in realism, however, as with Bariki 1 being a game based on MMA, the gameplay itself is a lot more grounded than most fighters. You'll find no fireballs or ancient evil gods here, instead you'll be focusing on well-timed strikes, knockdowns, and grapples. So let's pull out the Tupperware and get into the gameplay of Bariki 1. Each match is 90 seconds and takes place in a small ring. 
The goal is to win by either knocking your opponent out or by making them tap. And if the bell rings and both fighters are still standing, the match is won by decision, which is determined by a mixture of which fighter had the most health, who landed the most strikes and grapples, who had the most knockdowns, ringouts, you know, etc. Both fighters have a vitality gauge on the top which is your fighter's health, and it goes from blue to red the closer you are to being knocked out. Health gradually recovers as you're not getting hit, so playing patiently and smart can get you back into the match if you're near death. On the bottom of the screen, both players have a power balance gauge that displays a fighter's center of gravity. Every attack made will make your center of gravity sway into different positions that can make knocking down or grappling your opponent easier or more difficult. For example, if you hit an opponent who has a forward center of gravity, you'll strike them with a counter hit. This gauge is also a quasi power gauge, as it depletes as you are hit and it's your main defense against grapples as when a grapple is initiated, both players are putting their power balance gauges against one another to determine how long a grapple can last. The power balance gauge also refills automatically throughout the match. Now for the controls themselves. You have two buttons for movement, which are just a basic left and right that you can walk and dash with. Although this is a 3D game, your movement is on a 2D plane until you're backed into the edge of the ring or have an opponent knocked down, which will then have your character circle around vertically. By pressing both movement buttons together, your character will start guarding, which feels good and intuitive because you can easily start blocking while already moving by just holding down the other direction. Guarding does block all highs and lows in Pariki 1, but guard breaks are possible so you can't just guard all day, and even if you could, you would just get grabbed anyways. Every character also has a different guard strength, as some characters can take more high strikes than low strikes and vice versa. Now for attacking which is of course the most interesting part. You have an 8-way direction lever that has unique combinations for every character, which makes it a bit hard to explain because there's no standard in which everyone follows. A lot of it feels intuitive and makes sense though, like how a forward direction is most likely a quick or long range strike, while a down forward direction will be a low strike. But even that's not guaranteed for every character. Some characters will initiate a grapple of some sort with a flick of the lever, or do a counter, or even just lay on the ground. But there are more than just singular lever movements, as some moves require multiple movements of the wrist, like having to bring the lever backwards then forwards for a strike so the character can gain momentum, or a series of varied lever movements for a string of blows. It can get a bit complicated, but characters don't have too many moves to worry about, and you can focus on a very basic kit of good stuff for most characters to carry you through a match. Along with strikes of course come grapples, which are initiated with different lever movements inside or outside of strings of attacks that commits a sort of quick time event depending on the grapple, where the grappler has to perform more movements to finish or continue the grab. Depending on the grab and state of the character, sometimes the opponent also has the ability to break out of a grab with a well-timed button press and lever movement, so grabs aren't a guaranteed force to deal with. Once a fighter is knocked down, depending on the character's position a strike or grab can be performed on the down fighter for even more damage. Some attacks can also only be performed while dashing or even blocking, so there are tons of different options for characters all throughout the game's system. All of this creates a slower paced game than most fighters, where matches can be decided by one or two key moments rather than a snowball effect because players are allowed to go back to neutral pretty often. You can force opponents to ring out, or accidentally even ring out yourself, which will also just bring the match back to the neutral game. And I think this creates a bit of interesting strategy, because the player can decide to purposefully ring themselves out to avoid the corner and take heavy damage, but doing so could negatively affect their score if the match goes to time and a winner is chosen by decision. I also want to point out that the unique control scheme doesn't really lend itself to mashing, or I mean churning butter, because of how committal and situational attacks are. This is of course good in the long run, because you don't want a game where flailing can be an optimal strategy but it also lends itself to be a bit more awkward to pick up than your standard fighter, which was going to be an issue because of the alternate control scheme no matter what, but Padiki 1 does take time to really get used to properly. This can be remedied though by selecting the second system control type when selecting a character though, which is a little display that will showcase where the lever needs to go for certain strikes and grapples to follow through, and will also flash what buttons need to be pressed to break a grapple. This is obviously helpful, but it can also give your opponent a literal visual edge on your thought process and what you're trying to hit them with though. But enough of all that, let's take a look at the characters. 
But Ikki One has 12 characters, with Guy Tendo being our main boy representing his self-made martial art called Total Fighting. He's your standard hot-headed delinquent type with tons of charisma, and I honestly totally love his character. He's totally a Baki stand-in, who's also got some inspiration taken from real-world fighter Kazushi Sagadaba, who's renowned as one of Japan's greatest MMA fighters ever. He might be a trope, but he's a good one in my opinion. Next we have... Oh, hey, check it out, it's Ryo from Art of Fighting. But now he's in his cool Black Mr. Karate 2 outfit. So Bariki 1 takes place in the Art of Fighting and Fatal Fury universe, with Ryo competing to represent standard karate. I think he's one of the best characters to learn the game with because he has tons of good options, hits hard, and has some familiar moves. No fireballs though. Then we have Representative Payak, who's got the knees and elbows to knock you out. I usually gravitate towards liking Muay Thai characters in fighting games, but Payak was a little bit more difficult than others to pick up for me. He of course has the excellent Muay Thai pokes though. Our Taekwondo representative is So Yong Song, who is the pretty boy that has agile kick strings that can catch you off guard and hit you for big damage. Next is the Russian wrestler Ivan, and this dude is a monster. Being a Greco-Roman wrestler, Ivan doesn't have a lot of strikes, but he does have so many different kinds of grabs that just make him a slippery dude that can kill a vitality gauge super quickly and it might be hard to deal with for newer players. He seems to be based on Alexander Kerlin, who's considered to be one of the greatest Olympic wrestlers of all time. Sumo is represented by Akatsuki Maru, and he obviously has a lot of health and power while being a bit slow. His tackle while space can be a huge pain to deal with. If there is one character you might be able to get away with swinging the sticks in all 8 directions with and winning, it'd be our boxer Rob Python. Grabs aren't his strong suit, so he gets a ton of super strong strikes that melt a vitality gauge fast. Jacques is a judo practitioner who I think is definitely one of the hardest characters to play with. A lot of his moves are more reactive than proactive, so keeping up with the opponent can be a bit harder with him than others. Now we have professional wrestler Patrick Von Heiding who I think is also a pretty good character to pick up and play because he's got a good blend of strikes and throws that do a lot of damage and he can also take a lot of abuse himself. To me, the Goldberg and Stone Cold Steve Austin inspiration is very obvious. Then we have Takato, who is an Aikido practitioner. Sadly, he's not the best as he has a small vitality and balance gauge while lacking many powerful options himself. He shares a similar problem with Jacques as being more reactive than proactive. Finally for the main cast, we have old man Song Zuan Dao bringing Tai Chi to the tournament. I did not expect to like this dude as much as I did, but he's surprisingly super powerful and moving the sticks to the motions of his Tai Chi forms legitimately feels super cool. There is one more character who's a secret boss that can only be fought under certain conditions. His entrance to the final fight is super awesome and creates a great atmosphere for this wild fighter who's showcasing his so-called original karate fighting style. This Akuma lookalike is named Silver, and honestly the first time I fought him I was destroyed and I was worried I ran into some real SNK boss syndrome, but he can be taken down pretty easily once you figure out how to abuse his AI. He's actually playable by beating the game with everyone, which I did, but he didn't unlock. I couldn't figure out if I needed to do it without using a continue with everyone, or maybe he didn't unlock because I powered off the board between game sessions and the internal battery is dead, and it didn't save my progress. But just know that I tried to unlock him, and it hurt. From the looks of it though, I think his unlockable version is a bit more toned down than his boss version. And that's all the characters, and honestly, I think this is a great cast. Something I love is that every character has an alternate look for the second player that straight up just looks like they could be a different character for some, and it really helps give these martial arts stand-ins some more pizzazz. But for me, Lead character designer Hiroki's art has really brought the characters of Buriki 1 to another level, as his art is full of new millennium edgy flair that breathes life and makes the cast seem larger than life. Hiroki is still repping Buriki 1 20 years later too, as he drew new art for all the characters for its 20th anniversary and he seems to be pretty positive for the game on Twitter. He's not the only one keeping Buriki alive though, as there are still tournaments and fans showcasing the game at game centers in Japan. The fan-made Japanese wiki page has also been an invaluable resource to me while playing this game since there isn't much English documentation for this game out there, so learning this game was possible even for some random white dude on the other side of the planet. While sadly only being a standalone title, Bariki 1 does have a bit of a legacy within SNK. 
As Guy and Silver appear in the King of Fighters 11 as playable mid-bosses, some Bariki 1 characters showed up as cards in SNK vs Capcom Card Fighters Clash, and there have been other references sprinkled throughout various games. But even in Japan, Bariki 1 is still a niche game because it's inaccessible anywhere outside of the small amount of cabs with Hyper Neo Geo 64 boards in them, and for the fact that it requires a different layout just to play it, and of course the rest of the world is locked out of truly experiencing the game because emulation is playable, but it's still not perfect. So while SNK is better than most other devs at keeping their old games alive, I hope that one day we can see some sort of re-release for all these games trapped on the Hyper Neo Geo 64, because I'd love for everyone to get to experience these legitimately cool games, whether they're playing on a pad or some Tupperware. But until something happens, I'll keep asking when's Buriki 2. Thanks.